Welcome back to Asylum, a new podcast from Habibi Works. In this series, you'll hear directly from those seeking asylum in Europe. In our last two episodes, we spoke with a woman who dared to step into the unknown, fleeing Afghanistan for an uncertain future. For this series, she goes by the name Zarina to keep her identity anonymous. She has told us of her difficult decision to leave Afghanistan, her arrival in Greece, and her painful experiences in detention. In episode three, Zarina tells us about living inside Katsika's camp and how it has evolved over the four years that she's lived there. For a glossary of terms used in this episode, please read the description. I'm living in Kachika Kem in Ioannina city from 2019. In 2019, I have asked for an asylum service and I have been registered as an asylum seeker in Perama. So I was waiting for my interview and it was in a one year. When I entered, it was a new camp. There were so many facilities. The people were access in so many things. We had refugee support organization in our camp that they were supporting food and other hygienic materials for the refugees. And ASB was also supporting people at that time. And uh, we had Habibi Works next to these two organizations. We had RCs outside of the camp. They were providing food and clothing for uh, refugees. And there was another organization that was in the building of Kethea here in Ioannina. They were also supporting people, uh, like distributing clothing. And we had transportation that was free for refugees to travel to city and come back to the camp. It was so comfortable at that time. But now everything has changed. We don't have transportation to travel to the city. Most of the people, they don't go to the city, especially on Saturdays, the day that they do shopping, grocery. They don't go. Now it's difficult for people in the camp at that time who were accepted in asylum service, who had the travel documents. They would also take the same amount, like 150 euros. And the one asking for asylum also having the same amount. There was equality between these three categories, those being rejected also. But now those who are rejected and those who are accepted for asylum, they are not support financially. They have to survive themselves in this situation right now. My husband, he go early in the morning, 5.30 in the morning. He drive from here to Arthur to work there every day for 24 euros. He has to go early in the morning and arrive back at 7 o'clock in the night. Like for us, the situation is like we are running or we are in hurry to survive ourselves from this situation. When Zarina arrived at Katsika's camp in 2019, she entered a semi-open facility where several NGOs operated with relative freedom. But with every passing year, fewer services and organisations have been available to Zarina and the other residents in Katsikas. Perhaps the biggest change she has witnessed has been the increasing strictness of security measures. In early 2022, a three metre high concrete wall topped with barbed wire was constructed around the perimeter of the camp. Since then, the wall has been fortified with security cameras, entrance turnstiles, and bag and body searches for all the camp's residents. The security staff force, who regularly patrol within the camp, has tripled in size. Every resident must regularly prove they continue to live at the camp. If they fail to do so, they risk immediate expulsion. A woman from Afghanistan who currently lives in Katsika's camp and asked not to be named, wrote the following statement. In the past, we used to go to ESR for attendance, but now it has been about nine months that they have been taking attendance at the container doors. If a person is not in their container, the camp authorities will leave a letter telling them to present themselves by a specified deadline. Nasser, a man who used to live in Katsika's camp, 
was evicted for not presenting himself. He had not seen the letter. The security measures are justified in the name of protection, but at what point do they cross the line and become too restrictive? Serena shares how these transitions have felt as an asylum seeker living in the camp. The security measure, they said that it's safe for us. They built the walls, they are building now the gates, that uh, everything should be under control. Who is doing what? Everything should be under the eye of the authorities. The walls mentally is not good for the refugees inside the camp, for those who are living from long time. We know that the greenish area is good for mental health, but now we only see the white around us that affects our eyes also, like the concrete, the doors, everything has changed. We cannot see a, a greenish area. Sometimes I just ask for my husband during the Sundays that if we can go climb the mountain to see to sit there to have a comfortable time to spend with each other. It's so difficult to live now in the camp. Somehow I'm also afraid of being attacked by racist people. Like I have faced in the city one of the police in 2020 or 2019. One of my friend, her mother has passed away at that time and uh, while she was in the investigation process in the police station, they took the dead body from us. We didn't know where they keep the dead body. For us at that time, it was a new process that we were not being through. And the next day, her daughter was asking for me that let's go and ask from the police what they have done with the dead body. We have to have the dead body. When we went there, it was the corona time. There was a security guard in front of the police station. They asked from us directly, who are you, what you want? I said, I just want to go in to speak with them. And they asked from us, where are you from? And I said, we are from Afghanistan. They were so aggressive at that time. They react with us so aggressively. And I was confused with that uh, action. I didn't expect that the people were going to react here with us like this. And he was yelling at us, go back to your, uh, to your embassy and take your dead body, go with your dead body to Afghanistan. And I was asking them, please just allow us. And he was yelling that much that I thought that he was going to keep my head in his mouth. He was that much yelling at me. So especially I was not feeling safe in this place. After that reaction, I thought it was a police officer. So think that it is a security who is here to give us safe place. But if they react like this, it really defect my mental health. And from that time, I was just imagining that God forbid if a person just come with a gun and start shooting to all the cabins, what will going to happen? So. I was the first one in the meeting that I asked at that time from IOM. I was speaking with them that we want security to be safe here. But I didn't expect to create a wall or to make a door that it seems for us that <laughs> one by one you have to enter in a camp. We have so many securities now in the camp. I didn't expect this situation like they are moving around the cabins to control the situations. Closed facilities, such as the securitized Katsikas camp, have become the norm in Greece. Since Serena shared her story with us, even more security measures have been introduced, at the same time as the camp's population has more than doubled. <laughs> That's the end of episode three. Please join us again for the fourth and final episode of Zarina's story. <laughs>